Thank you very much. So let me just give you a snapshot of some of the big political conflicts happening around the world. Greta Thunberg at the United Nations telling the world's leaders that they've betrayed her and her generation, that they are creating a world, we just heard about, of climate catastrophe, but they aren't going to have to live in it. And she and her school friends are, and it's giving them nightmares. And world leaders pushing back, not just Trump, Merkel, Macron, telling Greta that she's the one giving children nightmares. And she needs to trust the grown-ups a little bit more and their grown-up solutions. Hong Kong, that we heard about. If you think about what's going on in Hong Kong and you had to characterize who are the protesters, what are the protesters, and you had to do it in one word, that word would be young. They're young. They're not all young, of course, but they are overwhelmingly young. In their 20s, in their teens, school children, protesting about censorship, surveillance, arguing for democracy, freedom, but also driven by their sense that they can't afford to live in Hong Kong, they don't see a future for themselves, they are being squeezed out of a viable future. Go back to the United States. So the big confrontation that's looming over the impeachment of Donald Trump. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the 29-year-old congresswoman, has been calling for Trump to be impeached for two years. And Nancy Pelosi, the 79-year-old Speaker of the House of Representatives, has been telling her to calm down. Leave this one to the grown-ups. Behave yourselves, children. And now the grown-ups are doing what the children want. And we'll see how that goes. And if Trump survives, as I suppose he might, it's likely that the next US presidential election is going to be between 70-year-olds, septuagenarians. Trump, 73, he might face the sprightly Elizabeth Warren, who's a mere 70. <laughs> Joe Biden, who's 78, 76. Bernie Sanders, who's a slightly less sprightly, 78. But there is a little notice rule in the United States Constitution. I've never known anyone even discuss this as an issue before now, which is you have to be 35 to run for president. When the Constitution was drafted, I'm guessing 35. It wasn't old, but it was kind of middle-aged. But I don't think anyone thought that rule mattered much, because who under the age of 35 could plausibly run for president? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez could plausibly run for president if it wasn't illegal. Would she win? I doubt it, but she might, because she has the one quality you really need to take on Donald Trump. She's very, very famous. Look at this country. So the Labour Party conference last week, the old men who run that party, they are old men, held the line against the young members who wanted to change the party's policy on Brexit turn it into a Remain party. And the old men, who are much more ambivalent about that, kept the young people at bay. The Conservative conference is going on this week, completely opposite institution. The Conservative membership is overwhelmingly old. 65 plus is the majority, very, very keen on Brexit, in line with their leadership. And we know that this is a big part of the Brexit story. The generational divide is at the heart of that part of our politics, which has swallowed all of our politics. So I'm sure you know, as I do, families that are divided by Brexit. You may belong to a family that's divided by Brexit. You may be dreading Christmas again for the third year in a row <laughs> that you have to try not to talk about politics so that people stay at the table until the pudding. Now, sometimes it's husband versus wife. Sometimes it's brother versus sister. But much more often, it's parents versus children. And this tallies with the evidence we have about how people voted on Brexit. So it tracks age. People in their 70s were nearly 70% likely to vote for Brexit. People in their 30s were much closer to 30% likely to vote for Brexit. We are divided, young versus old. So I can only think of one recent, very current political confrontation where you couldn't see the generation gap, and that was the one that we heard about at the beginning, which was last week in the House of Commons. So you will have seen it if you were unlucky. Boris Johnson standing at the dispatch box, being howled at with contempt and disdain and loathing by the opposition and giving as good as he got. And that was women against men. And that was class. And that was Remain against Brexit. And that was Labour 
versus Tory, but that was not young versus old, because there aren't any young people in the House of Commons. You can count on two hands the number of MPs in their 20s. There are some in their 30s. The vast majority are in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. I'm going to come back to that at the end, because I think it really, really matters. OK, now you might say, young versus old, plus a change. Isn't that the way the world works? Young people see the world one way, old people see the world the other way. They really don't agree, and sometimes they really hate each other. Yes. But no, I think this is different. I think what's going on now is really different. And understanding how and why it's different is crucial for thinking about the future of democracy, because our democracy is broken. This is one of the fault lines. But we need to know what the fault line is. So what is currently dividing young and old? So you've got the Greta Thunberg answer to that question. So she would say the difference is old people are more cavalier about the future because they're not going to have to live in it. They will be dead. And people who will be dead when the bad stuff happens don't care about it as much as people like her who will be alive and have to live with it. You hear that around Brexit too. Younger voters who are so angry about the outcome, furious that people who will be dead when this generational struggle plays itself out have voted for the thing that they won't be around to see. So I don't think that's a good argument. I think it's slightly unfair. But more to the point, I think it's not true. I do not think it is true that people who will be dead soon do not care about the future. So it is true when you survey people about climate change, survey voters, and you ask them, do you think it's the most pressing issue that we face? You get very, very different answers from the over 65s to the under 30s. So for people under 30, it is overwhelmingly the most pressing issue that people think they face. And for the over 65s, it is much, much, much lower down the list. But if you ask that same group of people about education, you say, is education the most important issue in contemporary politics? You get the same answer from the under 30s and the over 65s. They both say it is very, very important. Now, it can't be that that's because the over 65s are all planning to go back to college and to school. And it can't be because they think they're going to live in the world where the benefits of this education. It's because they care about the future. And again, you may know, as I know, families divided over Brexit, young parents in their, say, 30s with young kids, furious with their parents who voted for Brexit when they voted Remain. And they say to their parents at one of these Christmas lunches, you have betrayed your grandchildren. They've got to live in the world you created. And their parents say back to them, we did it for our grandchildren. And then you have to fill in the gaps because we want them to live in a world, dot, dot, dot. But that is at least a sincere argument. I don't think that that old people don't care because they will be dead, a kind of self-interested assumption works. So I think you've got to explain it in terms of experience and identity, not self-interest. Experience matters. Just, I'll just take a couple of snapshot examples again. If you think about climate change, experience really matters because the kind of radical changes that are being proposed that we hear about all the time that we're going to have to do in 20 years, in 12 years, fundamentally reorder our relationship to our economy, to work, to transportation. That sounds different and affects differently people who have much more experience of the world that will have to change than the people who have much less experience of that world, because all human beings suffer from loss aversion. Like we are young and old. We are all, and there's overwhelming evidence for this, we are all programmed to be more reluctant to give things up than to take an equivalent future benefit of something new. So if you just, I'll just give one example. If you just take our relationship to the automobile, to the car. So my son, who's 20, has no intention of learning to drive. Why would he? His friends have no intention of learning to drive. They don't imagine a future in which their ability to get behind the wheel of a car will matter to them. It'll either be self-driving cars, or it'll be the ubification of the world, or cars will have been outlawed, which will be fine by them. If you've lived your life with a relationship to a car, that kind of radical, you know, what we're hearing all the time, radical policy proposals to completely reconfigure that relationship, it doesn't make you selfish to be made uncomfortable by that. It makes you human. So if I was giving this talk six, eight months ago, and I was giving you a snapshot of the great political conflicts happening around the world, the one that would be most visible to us would be the Gilets Jaunes in France, the Yellow Vest movement. It's died down for now. It could flare up at any time. 
That was not young versus old when it started. That was middle-aged and older French voters who were furious with Macron about the tax that he'd put on diesel, which they thought was hypocritical and unfairly punishing them, people who were dependent on their cars. And then when it became a street movement, the young people joined in. And France also reminds us, and this I think is also really important, so we tend to assume young versus old, the young are on the side of the kind of progressive, green, liberal politics. Old people are grumpy, conservative, don't want change, fall for the populists, vote for Brexit, vote for Trump. Maybe true. But in France, Marine Le Pen support skews young. She has a lot of support among young French people. And that brings out another difference, which is this identity, belonging difference. Because the crucial distinction in that case is not just young versus old. It's young people who have been to university and young people who haven't. And that divide, the education divide, is the other great new cleavage dividing line in our politics. And it may be actually, and the, you know, the jury is still out on this, that the education divide is actually what's driving the generation divide. Because if you look at Brexit again in this country, the other thing that we now know is that if you want to know how someone voted in that referendum, and you could only ask them one question, you should ask one of these two questions, either how old are you, or did you go to university? They will give you the same amount of information. The sooner someone left the education system, the more likely that person was to vote for Brexit. And it tracks all the way up the education scale, from leaving with no qualifications through to having a PhD. Each step up, the voter was more likely to be Remain. And the reason that connects to the generation divide is that people over 70 were overwhelmingly likely to have voted for Brexit. Now, we're not a representative sample in this room. People over the age of 70 are very, very, very unlikely to have been to university because 50 years ago, roughly 2% of the population went to university before the great expansion of university education. And now, this year, for the first time among young people, it's 50%. Complete transformation of the electorate. Young versus old, educated versus less well-educated. The great French economist Thomas Piketty, who wrote Capital in the 21st Century, a book some people might know about, his current work is on what's driving divides in democratic politics. And he says you can sum up, if you want to understand the big change that's happened in our politics, you can sum it up in one sentence. The great political parties of the workers, traditionally the Labour Party, the Social Democratic Party in Germany, the Socialists in France, the Democratic Party in the United States, the parties of the workers, which used to represent younger vo workers and older workers, both, have become, in the last 50 years, the parties not of the working classes anymore, but of the university classes. Their support comes from university-educated voters. And that transformation is something new in the history of democracy, leaving the workers looking for somewhere to go. And that's a big part of what's going on in our politics. But then you have to recognize the other thing that's going on here, which is traditionally, if you could mobilize the workers, you would win, because there are more workers than capitalists, I can tell you. And it's still true. But if you mobilize the educated, and someone else can more successfully mobilize the people who did not go to university, they will win because there are still many, many more people who didn't than did experience higher education. And likewise, it used to be the case that if you could mobilize the young, you would win. I mean, it used to be said about democratic politics, the reason that young voters are so frustrated with it is they keep losing. But the reason they keep losing is they can't be bothered to get out of bed and vote. Whereas old people are happy to go down to the polling station and vote. So they win, so they get their pensions protected, so young people have to pay tuition fees. Vote was always the message to young people. Vote. If you want change, vote. So now, if every young person voted and every old person voted, the old people would win, because there are more of them. I'm tempted to say there are more of you. There are more of us, right? <laughs> and this is new in human history. We are the first societies in which the old, I mean, it depends where you draw the line, obviously, but more pensioners than students. The old outnumber the young. It's a real problem. And then I think you can also say that younger voters are doubly discriminated against. 
because this is where the education generation thing go in different directions. So again, let's take Brexit. It's the, you know, it's the perfect case study for all of this. So Brexit is an example of the fact that if you look at that referendum, essentially the mobilization of people who were angry for different reasons and wanted change for different reasons, but who shared, among other things, the fact that they did not go to university, outvoted the people who, among other things, shared the fact that many of them did or at least had more education. And I'm not making a qualitative judgment here about better or worse, just more. And so Brexit won. And then the decision goes to the House of Commons. Now, if you're one of the educated classes, you can take comfort from the fact that the decision then goes to a parliament where everybody went to university. Fewer than 10% of MPs currently do not have a university degree. And so they're stopping Brexit on this account. That's how it's going. If you want to explain Brexit through education, this is one way you can see it. The referendum produced one result, but it went to a parliament that's completely unrepresentative of the country because it's got no non-university educated people in it. Jeremy Corbyn is, but he dropped out. Whereas if you're young and you've lost an election, you can't look at Parliament and think, oh, thank God, at least we got an assembly where they're all like us, because none of them are like you. So on an issue like climate change, I think if you're young, you can feel doubly discriminated against because you lose the elections, you lose to Trump, you lose in this country, you lose in lots of places around the world to the more skeptical parties on climate issues. In Australia, we saw it, a climate election where the, the non-climate change party won because the older voters voted for that party. And it's not like then in parliament, you've got all these young people who'll speak for you. They won't because they aren't there. So what do you do about it? got four minutes left to tell you what you do about it. I have no idea what you do about it. <laughs> so this is what you don't do about it. So there is one answer to this problem, which is, again, the brutal answer, but it's, you know, it's mouthed by those brutal politicians like Nick Clegg, those monsters, who said, it's just a matter of time, wait for the old people to die. So you know, the line on Brexit, which you often hear, you know, seriously espoused now, which is, well, if we had a referendum now, three years later, enough of the people who voted for Brexit last time will be dead, and they'll have been replaced in the electorate by all of these lovely young people coming through, and maybe we could drop the voting age to 16 as well, and then we'll win. That's the Nick Clegg position. It's a really bad argument. It's thoroughly offensive. Uh, it makes a mockery of democracy to say that vote doesn't count because some of the people who voted for it are now dead. It's also really dangerous because it's not just the case that the old people drop off at this end and the young, everyone moves up, right? It's not like the young people stay young forever. We don't know what happens as people move through. I think that's a really bad way to go with this. But you, the fact that you hear it is evidence of just how toxic these arguments have become. I think we've got to address the issue of representation. I think there is something fundamentally broken in our system of representation and I think young people are the losers. There's always been an issue which has been addressed. It's still a huge way to go, but an issue around gender in the House of Commons. Um, 20 years ago, it was grotesque, the, la the lack of women MPs. We're moving in the right direction, still a long way to go. But relative to the discrimination against young people and also the discrimination against people who didn't go to university, that's where Parliament is now unrepresentative. Now, you don't hear about all young person shortlists or all non-university educated shortlists, because it doesn't really make sense. But we should at least start thinking about the fact that that parliament is unrepresentative in lots of ways. And the generation divide, which may be the education divide too, is part of it. So that's really important. You could also be much more radical about who gets to vote. So last year, I proposed on the podcast that I host that um, the voting age should be dropped to six. <laughs> and that was the response I got. Um, and the Daily Mail wrote a thing saying I should be fired from Cambridge University <laughs> for corrupting the minds of people with these um, outrageous ideas. And I got lots of emails from people that said, stop trolling us with your nonsense. The voting age should be lowered to six. What's the worst that could happen? Like, you know, we're talking about the future, these massive risks, and somehow people think allowing children to vote is the scariest thing we could do. What's wrong with people? And then finally, this is the last thing I'll say, I think we have to go back to that idea about experience. I think we have to remember there's something new going on here. This just isn't the age-old struggle between parents and children. 
there's something new here that younger generations have a radically different experience of the world than my generation and older on two questions in particular. First of all, obviously technology, to have grown up with this technology, the te what we're going to hear about from Carol, to have grown up surrounded by really potentially terrifying forms of technological interaction. Now, I work in a university, and people often say to me, How, why are young people so obsessed about safe spaces? Why are they so frightened of freedom of speech? If you'd grown up with this technology all around you all the time, you would be frightened of freedom of speech, because it's terrifying out there. And I think my generation does not understand it, does not begin to understand it because we haven't experienced it. And then the other thing, the last thing I'll say, is that the generations have radically different experiences of democracy. So if you're under 30, your experience of democracy is not good, hasn't been working well. My age and older, I think people think that it's probably the least worst system and that it's served us pretty well and it has its ups and downs and swings and roundabouts, but it comes out all right in the end. Why would anyone under 30 believe that? The last 10 years have been really bad for democracy. And if you think about loss aversion, what are you giving up if you're young and you're giving up on democracy? Now, I don't think there's any evidence that young people are giving up on democracy, but representative democracy, this system, this parliament, these parties, this way of doing it, the lack of experimentation, the lack of creative use of technology, the lack of deliberation, the lack of trust, the lack of citizens' assemblies and youth assemblies, there are a hundred things we could be doing, and what we're doing is shouting at each other in the House of Commons about who hates who most. Now, I look at that and I think, yeah, that's the way the world works. But my children look at that and it makes them sick. And I think they might be right. Thanks.